actually having the credit to practice, study, and research on biomimicry for a very long time. He's one of the few people from all over the world who holds the expertise, and he's the founder of Biomimicry Frontiers. And uh, the best thing is that he is trained by the person who coined this term biomimicry. And he will tell you more about that and the story when he uh, unveils his journey. And uh, he is also teaching at uh, Canada School. O we call it OCAD. OCAD, okay, yes. right. So uh, OCAD is the school. I, how do you, I mean, what's the full form for that? What is the expansion? Okay. Um, Ontario College of Art and Design. Okay, perfect. So he has been taking courses over there and uh, he is a passionate uh, individual when it comes to, he's a passionate speaker. He has given a couple of TEDx talks on biomimicry. And it's a great pleasure to have him here. And uh, we will be focusing on a couple of facets of biomimicry, not from the design uh, aspects, though his expertise lies in urban resilience studies that he has uh, worked on. However, today's focus will be on application of biomimicry on various other uh, facets of life, whether it is business applications, innovation, and even I mean, looking at something like COVID and post-pandemic uh, innovation that is required. So without further ado, uh, I welcome our guest. A uh, very warm welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So please, uh, why don't you tell us how did you start and from where your journey on biomimicry started? As a child, were you very fond of nature? What got you started really? Yeah, thanks. I think um, as a child, I was very fortunate to grow up in Canada with parents that appreciated the outdoors. So we spent a lot of time camping um, and canoeing and mountain biking. Um, and Canada has a lot of untouched territory. So a lot of backcountry stuff, which really felt, um, I really felt fortunate to be connected to the wild. It's really, there's no, where we would camp, there are no people. And it's a real neat experience to be immersed in that. Um, but yeah, so I've always had an affinity for the outdoors. And my dad um, grew up on a farm and we have a family farm. So I've been close to agriculture and in nature in that way. But um, my biomimicry journey really began in my undergraduate uh, or my undergraduate courses. I was taking engineering at Queen's University and um, we learned a lot about how to do engineering. And I took environmental engineering because I thought we would learn about the environment. And um, I really didn't understand engineering at the time. And what I was being taught or what I thought it was, was just learning how to engineer the environment. And we learn very specific techniques for how to do uh, piping and, and urban infrastructure and how to build roads. And I really was confused by the lack of creativity. I thought there, there must be other ways of thinking about these systems. Absolutely. Um, but we were being taught a very homogeneous kind of way of doing things. And so I took this course, this elective course called Math and Poetry, um, where we spent an hour and a half learning about poetry and an hour and a half learning about math. Good. And the teachers who were teaching it were just so brilliant. They, they had us walk through these poems and these math theorems as if we were discovering them and uncovering them for the first time. That's really uh, fascinating. I mean, combination of maths with poems. That's like, can't yeah. even imagine in India like that. Yeah, and I was shocked because I thought maybe we would talk about the math of poetry, you know, like looking at cadence and looking at patterns. But they just kept they kept the conversation separate and let kind of us create the combinations through metaphors. It was like playing with those two worlds. Mm -hmm. But it was in the math and poetry section where our professor introduced the Fibonacci sequence. Okay. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, it's just a sequence of numbers where when you add the two numbers prior, you get the third. So zero, starting with zero, zero plus one is one, yeah. one plus one is two, one plus two is three and so on. And, the, and then he had us explore this number through shapes. So we played with one by one boxes. We put a one by one by a one by one and you got a two by two box to fit in there. And then you got the three by three box to fit in that package. Um, and then we, we, we connected all the corners and we got this beautiful spiral. And then he had us, he asked us, where have you seen this spiral before? And we started to brainstorm it's like well it looks like the packaging of sunflower seeds actually these are sunflowers right behind me that are just um, about to bloom or the packaging of pine cones or in the way that waves curl and crash 
-hmm. And so once that kind of, once he unearthed this connection between math and the natural world, my mind, I, I truly had my paradigm shift. I had kind of my mind shocked that there's an engineering model that I never thought to look at that being nature. And we could learn how to do packaging. We could learn how to do sequential design um, from nature. And so that was really the, the catalyst of my biomimicry journey. From there, um, I read a few books. One, I remember Cats, Paws and Catapults, which is a great little book on the engineering of nature. What's um, the name of the book, is it? It's called Cats, Paws and Catapults. Oh, so like the relation cat, between the two well they're talking it was cool because they would look at um the way that cats can create such generate such kinetic force like springing mm -hmm. for such a small animal and, and they don't seem very muscular but they can jump so high yeah and so they're comparing that to catapults and all sorts of different organisms that they were okay. exploring um so yeah from there i i actually i ended it ended up doing a lot of uh, work in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, after the 2004 tsunami, mm -hmm. um, and met a, a great man there who taught me about permaculture and introduced me to biomimicry, the, the term. And so when I came back from my work there, I I found Janine Benyus, I found the book. Um, I met with her and Dana Bomeiser down in Co Costa Rica. And really, it's been an ongoing journey since then. We've worked together several times. And um, I've been obsessed with it to the point where I, I, I had, I, I didn't ever expect to do graduate work, but because I couldn't find places that were doing biomimicry, I just decided to do a PhD in biomimicry. So, and that's what led me to, to here today. It's starting frontiers after my PhD. Okay. That's great. So how would you define biomimicry and uh, how would you even connect the scope and applications? Because when you say that you're able to connect something like a catapult with cat's paws, I mean, the correlation could be as random and as unexpected as it is seeming to be. So uh, what would be the definition for a common person to even get started? Yeah, Janine Benyus, the woman who coined the term, says that biomimicry is innovation that's inspired by nature. So a, the most classic example is Velcro, where a Swiss engineer in the 1940s was getting fed up with burrs sticking to his dog's hair. And he took that burr under a microscope and saw these little hooking mechanisms called barbules. And he just created Velcro by copying that hooking and that netting of, of dog hair almost. Okay. So it's innovation that's inspired by nature. But for me, it's, it's fundamentally a way of looking at the world. So in my journey, I truly look at everything with a biomimetic lens and say, well, how could nature do that differently? Or even looking at these sunflowers, how is nature doing what it's doing? Like, how is this structure? These are about 16 feet, these sunflowers behind me. Um, okay. and, and you wonder, yeah, you wonder how can they structurally maintain that and with the winds and, and the pressures. So I'm always looking at things through a biomimetic lens, which means I'm looking at it in terms of design and innovation. And I'm looking at what we've designed and said, well, how could nature do that differently or better? So uh, do you think, is there any kind of correlation between skyscrapers and uh, high rise buildings that we have? Is there any correlation with nature? Is that innovation inspired by nature? No, I don't think it was ever, well, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's conscious emulation of nature, but you can see a resemblance in terms of how they look, but What's neat about biomimicry is that um, you can look at it in different levels. So you can copy nature's forms, which is what I think you're alluding to. It's structurally, they, they may look like trees. They're tall. Um, but the deeper levels of biomimicry is looking at the processes in nature and then the systems in nature. And that's what makes it really sustainable. So um, thinking about how nature manufactures is where we get very different between us and the rest of the natural world. So this sunflower is creating structure using only the energy of the sun. It's using benign manufacturing, which means it's all water-based chemistry. So it's making materials, it's growing using water chemistry, and it's doing its, all its manufacturing at body temperature and pressure. Whereas we make our structures using robust materials like bricks or cement or, or concrete and steel, which all of those have intense energy inputs. 
It takes a lot of energy and material to make those. Um, and then it's also non-renewable in the sense that once these sunflowers die, there's no harm. It's actually manifesting more soil for more growth um, and it decomposes naturally. So that's biomimicry at a process level is copying how nature creates. And then the system level, which is the, the most, uh, I'd say the deepest level is that you're looking at how this sunflower then relates to the rest of its ecosystem. And is it a contribution to the rest of the ecosystem? Is it creating conditions that are conducive to more life? Um, that's what Janine says is the ultimate metric for biomimicry is what you're doing, making more life. Um, and that's a really cool place to start to explore with our cities is we've designed a lot of nature out of our cities. In fact, we really designed to resist nature. If you think of how we build buildings, it's, it's about keeping nature out so that we can have very controlled, predictable environments, which is okay. I don't have anything against that. But then if you think of how much energy input that takes to do that with air conditioning or um, the materials we use, that has a pretty large impact on the ecosystems around us. We have to import lots of energy and materials. We export our waste. And so at a systems level, our buildings are pretty, um, they're not very good at creating conditions conducive to more life. And, and that's kind of the, the real challenge that our company, Biomimicry Frontiers, focuses on, is how can we make our infrastructure a contribution, not just do less harm, like how can it truly be a contribution to its ecosystem, just like every other natural structure on the planet. So would you like to share some examples where visually we could actually see the marvel of uh, biomimicry? Yeah, sure, be happy to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you are the host. Excellent, thank you. So, um, yeah, so I'll quickly go through um, the main things that our, our company does is we do consulting. That's our primary work. We do education because a lot of people don't know the term biomimicry, even though a lot of people understand it at its core the term biomimicry is relatively new. Um, and we also support technology incubation and research and investment. So I'll just show you some of our projects. Um, this is a, a, a project we did in, um, in Vietnam where we applied that systems level thinking to, bio, to, um, to urban development. It was a 200 hectare urban plan and it was on a river delta. And so what we did with our clients, B plus H, is started to map out the story of the place or the, the living story, we call it. Um, our philosophy with urban design is that we first have to know what the land wants to do. I know in Canada, often um, there are environmental assessments, but then typically landowners will pretty much bulldoze the land and build a system on top of that. But we like to look at the ecosystem and understand, okay, where is it going? What's the trajectory? If we were to never build on this place, what would naturally occur? Because we want to work with those components. And we're looking for ecological services because nature is, is the best at water treatment and stormwater management and uh, storm dissipation and carbon sequestration. And we look at all of those ecological services and say, one, how can we keep nature intact to help us do those things. And if we do have to disrupt them, how can our buildings or our infrastructure replace those services? So the first thing we do is really a land use map. And, and this project in, um, in Vietnam on river deltas, we, we really understood the river dynamics, knowing that it's a very complex dynamic um, land to, to, to work on. And then from there, we just, we built out eco zones um, and suggested, you know, putting certain buildings in certain areas so that it has more resilience um, and is less prone to the disruption of that delta. So that's a high level systems application of biomimicry. Um, I'll show you um, a more practical form based biomimicry. So with a uh, indoor agricultural facility, um, we applied these impellers 
that look like the spiraling of, of seashells. They're called Pax Impellers, and we have a partnership with Pax, um, and they're based out of California. And so they, their technology um, mixes fluids. And these little guys can actually mix 10 million gallons of water with the electricity of two light bulbs. And the reason it's more efficient at mixing is because it's, it's following the natural um, shape of water. So if you think of, na if, if you think of water, um, often it, it, it goes in spirals. If you think of when you pull a plug on a bathtub, you get that vortex. Um, or in uh, currents where you get um, turbulent flow, you'll get these eddies and these vortices. So the inventor of these technologies, um, Jay Harmon, he was inspired by the way that kelp in a coastal region would just curl with the waves. As a wave crashed over kelp, the kelp curled. And then he looked at a seashell and saw it broken open and saw this spiral. And so he made these impellers that are much more efficient at moving water than a traditional propeller. So um, what were, when you say it was much more efficient, what were the uh, additional qualities that it displayed? It was 20% more efficient than a traditional um, blade uh, okay. moving the same amount of water. And they've also applied this to fans and it's in the fans so moving air that they've actually seen the biggest um, economic gains. It's actually 80% more efficient than any other fan um, out there. And it's also much quieter. So it's done comparison against Dyson um, and then you know some of the, the big fan manufacturers and they're just starting to explore um, like personal home fans as a potential mm -hmm. application. And so, sorry, we put these in the agricultural facility and um, helping them mix their irrigation water, their irrigation tanks. Okay. So, uh, you want to show some more examples, or I had a question regarding uh, the. Okay, let let's go ahead. Okay, I can share these as well. So this yeah. is in Toronto, in Canada. We're applying these windows that um, copy. Spider silk. So spider silk reflects ultraviolet light. And as humans, we can't see UV light, but birds can. And so it's a clever design because that means birds won't fly into these spider webs because they can see them. So Ornilux has made a window that copies this and it reduces bird collisions by 70%, but it doesn't impact human view because we don't see that ultraviolet light. So we're putting these windows in a condo in downtown Toronto. Um, this is the Pax impeller that I was talking about, that Lily yeah. impeller. Um, one more example, this is a really cool one. Uh, a student in Germany um, was inspired by pine cones, which open and close with moisture. So pine cones will actually close up when it's, when it's wet out to avoid yeah. dropping their seeds. And the student made a wall that without electricity or any mechanical devices opens and close just like the pine cone. And in this case, it was an art piece. There was no true function for it. But I love that he copied the process of nature to make a wall that could have functional strategies. I mean, I was imagining this in a greenhouse that needs to have proper ventilation or in areas of high moisture, like a bathroom or, um, you know, anywhere where there's high humidity. I mean, even in India, I know when during your monsoon seasons, there's lots of humid humidity. And so to allow airflow, um, uh, it's a very cool design. And then my last example I'll share, sorry, is this is again process. So okay. research in Stanford um, copied coral reefs and coral is very much a very strong building material. Um, and it uses only seawater and carbon dioxide. So it actually sequesters CO2. Our cement um, production emits a lot of CO2 and as a way to reverse that, this research at Stanford um, found a way to make um, something that's as strong as Portland cement, mm -hmm. um, but that's only made from seawater and CO2. So it's ac actually sequestering um, CO2, just like a coral. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Great. So uh, the question that I was actually waiting to ask was related to the COVID scenario, because uh, we are facing some unprecedented uh, pandemic and we don't have answers. I mean, there are a lot of innovations happening in uh, various uh, geographies across the world, but 
those are not holistic in nature and none of them actually seems to be inspired by nature so having uh, spent so much of time on this subject biomimicry would you be able to you know share some of the insights how we could take cues from nature in facing something like covid-19 yeah i i actually did a video a short video on this for my team and some of our clients and it's on youtube i'd be happy to share it yeah yeah sure but the biggest thing um that we learned is that so nature maintains resilience by releasing at multiple scales so when the trees lose their leaves in the fall in canada that's an opportunity for the next set of leaves to be more attuned to its environment so release and reorganization happens at multiple scales in nature in in human environments especially urban infrastructure there's a tendency to want to maintain and conserve systems for a long period of time for example in canada our sewer systems are 100 more than 100 years old and they're constantly failing but they're hard to get at um so we avoid release and we have the ability to put energy into systems to conserve them to maintain them and that's a big difference between us and nature is that that avoidance of release actually makes our system more susceptible to collapse in fact large scale collapse and so this is to say that covid is a large scale release um and when release happens things get disrupted and then it's an opportunity for reorganization that's like when when a forest fire happens all of those nutrients are put back into the ground and new new ecosystems can emerge and those systems will be more attuned to its environment i mean a good example is um imagine a willow tree on a riverbed or on a on a river riparian zone and if that river to were were to dry up that willow would die and its nutrients would go back into the soil and the species that would come up or the ecosystem that would succeed would be perhaps more drought resistant because it knows there's no river there anymore we need to have new conditions and so this is how i truly see covid is that it's a massive disruption and it's making us reorganize on multiple levels it's reorganizing how we do business but fundamentally i i'm hoping that it's having us release our mental models and our our mindset for how we do design um that it can disrupt traditional thinking so that we can see that nature when we let it go and when it when we let it be natural it can survive and thrive and actually help us help us thrive on this planet so i'm seeing uh, uh, the covid uh, pandemic as it's it is i definitely recognize that it's a it's a very difficult thing but it's also an opportunity to release and reorganize and we're hoping that companies that see sustainability as a key to moving forward recognize the importance of biomimicry and bring that into their mentality into their mindset and into their practice so that we can make systems that are more in harmony with with the natural world probably that is nature's way of telling us that uh, there is something beyond sustainability and that is regeneration yes and we are looking at a regenerative approach to life that's right yeah okay great So um I wanted to share something that we have been uh, focused on that is a mission called prakriti and now that we are partnering I'm sure that you are also briefly exposed to that so uh, as far as that we are trying to create forests and by means of creating forests we are trying to solve several uh, socio ecological problems so when it comes to looking at uh, even if you look at sdgs we have 17 sustainable development goals and the array of uh, focus when it comes to uh solving something related to a sustainability challenge it's huge i mean we have diversity ranging from water energy uh and people issues so how do you think that we can uh take biomimicry as a cue to solve uh challenges across these spectrum yeah it's a great program and a great challenge and i i um i love that that's where your your group is heading um in terms of the application of biomimicry it's it's really about adopting that mindset so it's like how could nature do things more effectively mm-hmm. and if you constantly ask that question you'll keep checking in with nature and seeing or thinking about examples that might inform it so if it's reforestation you could look at well how does nature reforest or or you know create forests in an ecosystem and we can learn from ecological succession we can learn that a forest doesn't just all of a sudden grow 
there's our species, and then there's rapid death and renewal and succession um, towards these complex K species. In social situations, you can, you can ask, well, how does nature make better communities? And you could look at ants and how ants are um, semi-autonomous in the sense that each ant isn't governed by the top down. There isn't one king ant telling all the little ants what to do. They're I'm all- I'm sorry to interject here, but that reminds me of the new mission that India is undergoing that is called Atmanirbhar Bharat. And Atmanirbhar uh, Bharat is of course the name for India and Atmanirbhar means self-reliant. So yeah. The new uh, way to go forward, self-reliant India. So I think uh, the cue is from ants, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so your whole country is biomimetic, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you, I mean, that's, that's the key is you, you just always ask nature and, and the fun part of my job is to the, then go and explore. How does nature do that? Um, a quick example in India, we designed a house and for passive cooling, we looked at barrel cactus and we looked at elephant skin and found design strategies inspired by those two organisms. And so I truly believe that any, any challenge we face could be informed by the natural world. Okay. So uh, out of your experience, when it comes to your own life, uh, have you been solving some of your personal challenges that you faced? Because you got exposed to this when you were doing your PhD, right? Or before your PhD, yeah. in engineering time, rather. Yes. So uh, any of your engineering complex problems that you were able to solve using biomimicry approach? Um. I mean, the first one that comes to my mind is that um, my thesis, my PhD thesis, which was on ecological resilience, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was really personal in the sense that I learned about that, that loop, that conservation, release, reorganization, and exploit. Yeah. I learned about that loop through experience. I, I was trying to... Um, try to conserve and putting a lot of energy into maintaining a relationship specifically with my professor. And it was very, very difficult. Um, and to the point where it, it kind of just collapsed on its own. And I learned through that release and reorganization that, you know, allowing release and recognizing when things need to fail, it's okay to let them fail sometimes because you can then regroup and reanalyze and come back at it um, with a fresh perspective. And so I used it on a very personal case and I have used it in engineering. Um, for example, we designed a wastewater system that emulates um, uh, wetlands. Um, I've used it for uh, innovation on an urban development project here in, in Guelph. And we're, we're currently working on a circular food economy. So thinking that nature is all, everything is circular Whereas our systems are pretty linear where it's, that's right. we, we pull from the earth, we manufacture, we sell, we waste, and then it decomposes in a landfill. Um, so in Guelph here, we have a $10 million grant from the government to build the first circular food economy, which we're a part of, and we're using biomimetic okay. principles there. So, so yeah, I think that's a wide, gives you a, a breadth of how I use biomimicry. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it proliferates much of my thinking as you I, I really like that uh, concept of you know thinking circular when it comes yeah. to systems and processes um so that brings me to the uh, question with which we would actually uh, leave the room open for q a so the question is that we have uh, seen that the world has been walking i mean moving in a certain direction in a certain way the things are happening in a certain way even the whole visualization of sustainability and solutions related to that is also uh, assumed to be in a certain way. Not all the while uh, circular economy is the new concept and everybody uses that buzzword, but how much is that applied? And we all know that, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you see uh, biomimicry is going to shape the future when it comes to restoring urban ecology? Since your uh, majority of the work has been in urban residence, so what are the what is the way forward and what's the roadmap that you see yeah um so we, our our mission is to make it better naturally and what we're committed to is working towards climate change and i think similar to you the biggest impact from my research that we could have on mitigating climate change is to increase intact ecosystems 
So allowing more complex systems to survive. And so um, that's, that's our number one mission is to build um, infrastructure, build communities that are really have complex ecosystems, like marrying those two worlds and not having them so contrasting. Um, in terms of biomimicry in the future, uh, I truly believe it's, it has unlimited potential, but the barrier is in how many people understand it or know about it or really commit to it. Um, I find a lot of, you know, engine, well, uh, certain sectors struggle with the concept and they need very practical examples. And I appreciate that. And so that first having people understand what biomimicry is and then helping people see it through practical application will be what makes it, I think, popular. And um, the more people, though, that are applying it, that's why part of our mission is to educate. Um, the more people that are applying it, then the more examples we get and the more uh, it'll grow. But um, there's unlimited potential because nature knows how to thrive on this planet and we just have to learn to look. That's right. So great. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, with this, we will actually leave the room open for questions. I saw there were some uh, questions right from the beginning. I just yeah. uh, try and look, look them up. So um, one second. Okay, so one question is uh, again about COVID. That is uh, how this COVID situation can be solved when, when it comes to the social fabric of it. How is it relatable to biomimicry? So just to reiterate, how can COVID be solved like socially through biomimicry? Is that the yes. question? Yes, because it is a contagious disease. The way it is yeah. spreading, that spread. If Because it's related to a virus spread. So is there a cue from biomimicry that we can uh, look, at, look up? <laughs> That's a, a great question. Um, a great challenge that I truly have no expertise in. Um, an epidemiologist could probably answer that better but I, I think it's interesting to look at how um, disease spreads in the natural world and how ecosystems might mitigate that and and it might be through I don't think this is relatable but if I just look at nature I understand that diversity and redundancy is a good way of mitigating against diseases so for example if you have I know we've had um, uh, certain diseases in in certain tree species in Canada so um, our oak, or sorry, our, our chestnut trees were decimated by a pest, but um, not all of the forest was decimated because they were diverse. So I, I don't know the answer, but it would be interesting to look at how ecosystems deal with, with viruses. Um, and that's where I, I would go. But unfortunately, yeah, it's not my expertise. Okay. There's one more question that says that how is naturopathy connected to biomimetic way of life. I mean, the, the me, what I read was that the mission is to enhance the quality of life for all stakeholders, including, mm -hmm. including nature and biomimicry is about, I mean, the first is, step is to recognize that nature holds some good ideas. The next step is to then copy those. But I believe that when we recognize the importance of nature beyond just uh, and as a natural resource, as lumber or as coal, you know, or as whatever it is that we use it for. Um, when we realize its importance, we will want to keep it around. And so, you know, the mission to enhance the way of life uh, for us is very similar that we want to enhance natural ecosystems and in doing so um, enhance human life because our entire species depends on a, in a complex intact ecosystem. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that through biomimicry, we can have a greater appreciation of the genius of nature. Okay, great. So there's one more question that says, what are some of the applications of biomimicry within the digital landscape of our society? Um, again, not my area ex of expertise, but I do know that um, there are, there's one company that made computer servers that emulated honeybee communication strategies. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details that well, but if you look it up, I'm, I'm sure you'll find more. There's also a software and hardware program that um, uh, copies 
swarm technology. So whether it be bees or locusts and how they swarm and communicate through swarms, mm -hmm. um, they help make more efficient um, electronic infrastructure. So in a building, if you have your HVAC system connected to your lighting, connected mm -hmm. to your computers, um, this, this software helps communicate between the, all of those systems to make it more efficiently run. Hmm. Uh, Shetakshi, I would request uh, people who are asking the questions to allow them to ask so that they can also interact with the speaker. That would be better. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I see Adrian and uh, Abdeli Jalil. So I have um, a pop-up here. Should I, it says answer live. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that's what I was thinking because uh, if questions from the Zoom participants could be directly answered, I mean, directly asked by them, that would be better. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, just one second. Shatashi, are you able to give them the uh, speaking rights? Just allow them to talk? Okay, I'm the host now. All right, just one second. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Karam, I think you are allowed to talk. Can you please uh, unmute yourself? Mr. Karam? Okay, I don't know if he can hear us, but uh, I'll just read out the question in that case. So, yeah. Have you answered this question? Okay. In which areas you see the most potential for biomimicry application in the next 10 years? So, I... I... <laughs> When I think of this question, um, my first response is everywhere. Um, and it's going to depend on the type of people who learn about biomimicry and really commit to applying it. So mm -hmm. our, our work is we want to empower people to apply biomimicry to whatever they're good at. So if you're a digital and technology, you know, that's the case. If you're in landscape and planning, you know, architecture and landscape architecture. But where I think it can have the most impact is in uh, building and design, because that's where my focus is. And that's where there's a huge um, climate change uh, impact happening. Design thinking actually originates from that systemic approach that you can uh, you know, get inspiration from nature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Narun Kishore. Yeah. Yeah, please ask your question. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a very interesting field. Uh, I've been following this field and even your websites uh, for for the last couple of years. And uh, I'm very excited to do this, but what I'm finding it is, how do we evangelize it and proliferate it to the wider audience and stakeholder to understand? So <laughs> biomimicry is one of the interesting perspective for uh, your sustainability or circular economy. But the thing is, is uh, different evangelists pursue these different missions in silos again. How do we bring them together as a force and interconnect as a homogeneous framework that look uh, how uh, these different components of structural economy brings in this aspect, biomimicry brings in this aspect, these aspects, uh, uh, you know, bring in the other thing. And then as a whole sum, it becomes a real, uh, you know, based on each stakeholder can identify in his use cases in the environment and domain where he's working, he or she is working, what paradigm of sustainability can they leverage to bring more, uh, you know, uh, make more sense or at least contribute in their own individual or collective way? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's honestly, it's been one of the toughest things that we've been working on is how to evangelize it as a systems approach. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer yet other than persistence and application. The more we persist in applying biomimicry and telling the story, Mm -hmm. um, the, the more people will understand. I will say though, there's in Canada, the, the indigenous people who lived here before us Westerners have this very systematic approach to nature and a very different paradigm. 
that in my mind is very biomimetic. And so it's when these voices get heard, um, you know, that's when we'll start to see that the system uh, is, is how we have to approach this. And like you said, not in the silos, but when we think of everything through that systems lens um, and using biomimicry at that level, in, I guess in my mind too, I see the future, the word biomimicry might just drop off. Um, it might not be important anymore if we can start to think systematically because that's the true essence of biomimicry is recognizing that we are nature, that we are natural and without nature, we're dead. So <laughs> once we get that, um, I think we're in the right track. So I use biomimicry somewhat as a interesting story to introduce people to that that mm -hmm. idea of how nature can inspire better ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So the, the way I find is if we can simply somehow connect them together, the, this with circular economy and then bring yeah. it, uh, you know, create a big, bigger framework and then say, okay, this is the holistic framework. Here, biomimicry can bring in some these kind of, uh, you know, yeah. values and uh, here circular economy and bring this. And as a whole, this becomes yeah. a real comprehensive sustainability framework. You get yeah. my point? Uh, uh, that that was my thought. If we could do that, I'll be happy to work with you and bring in. So I'm also for doing some standard on circular economy at uh, the UL. So so there again we are looking at. So but I've seen most evangelists do it in a silo mode. Unless yes. we can them, uh, bring a big picture, holistic uh, this thing and system thinking, system approach. So I I already pursue quite a lot of complex reference architecture, reference modeling for complex yes. domains. I'm doing smart city reference architectures. Now I'm getting into much more deeper, much more complex. Like people talk about cybersecurity architecture. I'm talking yep. about us worthiness reference architecture. I'm, but uh, I'm able to address this complex problem with a system approach only. Top yep. down, look at it, how do they uh, interwork, where they can play each role, how they are connected. If you are able to find the connection and bring a, connect the dots, yeah. our job is done, I think. We will... Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll actually facilitate the connection between the two of you because uh, we are uh, we both of us yeah. are actually partnering biomimicry frontiers and okay. uh, Bazaar uh, to facilitate consulting in this space where we can connect all the dots whether it is smart cities or you know urban resilience and uh, residential so or so I'll be happy to work with you but, uh, you know uh, yeah. you know I'm very fascinated about these things and like to contribute Great. thank you thank you for giving me a chance to share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Adrian, you had something to say? Maybe yeah, I thank you very much uh, for this very interesting topic in the energy unit. Um, it's interesting to see you're based in Guelph. Two of my colleagues are also based in Guelph and probably looking over your shoulder right now, be afraid. <laughs> um, I, I guess my, my question is pretty much the same, uh, but I'm coming from much more sort of business application, practical approach. I mean, I, I've been aware of and, and been considering biomimicry in lots of spaces for, for many years. Um, and it is hugely engaging and hugely uh, full of huge potential, but it can't stay in that niche creative space in my view. So what is it that's going to take it to move to become more the norm is my question, to get it away from, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, support your position that just doing more of it will get it over the line. It needs something. Um, there's a there's a mm -hmm. commitment from business to business for nature as a campaign to get uh, governments to ask businesses for more commitment to nature. Um, potentially success from nature is mm -hmm. a strategy that could be adopted as part of that or other similar activities on things like regen, regen ag, etc. I'm just interested in your thoughts over what is it that will give that step change, uh, that paradigm shift to move this to uh, more more natural approach, a more normal approach, a more business as normal approach, rather than great creative solutions that uh, architects will implement to help promote a unique activity. It needs to be much more in my, in my game. <laughs> Again, it, it's such a good question that I don't know the answer to or, um, but what, what comes to mind is, you know, what we're committed to, like I said, is just the application to show people what it is, because I think people need tangible examples. But I think you're right. Um, there is, there is needs to be something more. And if I look at it at a more spiritual level, or even looking at some of the research that's done on collective paradigms and collective consciousness, I think there is an application there that once we start to 
step out of this Newtonian paradigm, which I think is happening rapidly, and look at the quantum physics and look at how um, what we used to know doesn't make as much sense anymore as it used to, that's when I think we can tap into the true genius of biomimicry and see it at a collective level and as a paradigm shift where there's a collective release or almost like a cascading release where once certain people take it on and adopt it, um, it'll start to cascade and it'll become more of a collection, collective consciousness. And that's- I think there is an, an opportunity though, Jamie. I mean, you talked earlier about an example where there's 20% efficiency. I mean, yeah. the biggest case yes. element of this, yeah. I think it's a real opportunity that, you know, I'd be delighted to get my team local to you to have a chat about to see if we can help capture yeah. some of yeah, and so that's, it's funny because that's been a challenge for the biomimicry community, which is very niche, but a book um, that I'd highly recommend is Jay Harmon's um, The Shark's Paintbrush. Jay's the one I mentioned who invented the impeller, and he's been doing biomimetic business for years, uh, trying to understand that exact question, why is it not as popular as it could be when it shows proven efficiency time and time again? Why are people not adopting it? And so... Um, that's yeah that would be a great book to start with and a great conversation that i'm always trying to have is how do we make this more prevalent thank you thanks very much okay so uh, miss gita bhadoria you have a question you can unmute yourself and ask the question Uh, Jenny, I just wanted to know whether this biomimicry can be used anyhow in creating learning model for students. Uh, I believe yeah, the answer is yes. Um, specific examples. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my mind, but that would be a systems approach biomimicry is looking at how different systems in nature might help inform education. And I, I apologize for not having a a good answer to that, but I truly believe that um, we can learn that. And it might go back to that idea of systems thinking and, and stopping the silos. And if you, I guess, actually, as I'm speaking, if you think of the ants, um, ants aren't, uh, all of them have an individual role and job to play towards a larger group. And they're all good at one thing. And they're, you know, one thing about our education system is trying to force students to be good at everything. Um, and, and maybe that's one way of looking at it, is how to enhance their specialty or what they're a natural at, as I call it. Like, what is their inner biomimicry? What are they here to do? What are they specialized in naturally? Um, and really honing those. So, I'd, yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of brainstorm what that would look like. Um, but I do believe it could inform the education system for sure. Like, I was always fascinated by how Parrot is able to understand the human syllabic language and anything like that. And when yeah. we can make parrots to understand human language, then something could be developed for the students even if they can be able to learn some complex materials or complex yeah. topics with the help of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even primates or, you know, crows. There are so many interesting ways that animals uh, learn. Like crows are able to recognize faces and speech language. And um, yeah, there, there could be some really cool things that you could learn from nature in that regard. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Yep. All right, uh, Mr. Andreas, do you have a question? Please unmute yourself. Okay, Mr. Andreas Frankel. Okay, I don't know uh, if he's there, but we have uh, one more comment from uh, Mr. Kishore. And he is suggesting that uh, you may find interesting uh, my definition of civilization 6.0, a nature aware society that balances societal, economic, and technological advancement with climate and nature's equilibrium, making the planet Earth carbon ne neutral, leveraging nature inspired technology solutions to practice the tenet of circular economy. Definitely uh, would, would catch up uh, definitely on this. And I'll share this with you, Jamie. So, yeah. Andreas, are you there? Please unmute yourself. Okay, I don't uh, see him there. I can actually read his question. Oh, he's saying he could not enable the microphone. Okay, okay, got it. 
So I'll ask your question. Don't worry. He's asking: Do the sustainable development goals cover biomimicry, or do they need to be enhanced by this topic? A yeah, good question. They don't explicitly yeah. cover biomimicry, um, and they could be enhanced. I think one thing we're exploring is a biomimetic building standard or living standard. Um, so taking what's out I'll there. I'll be very happy to be the proponent of such a standard <laughs> because we really, really need that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it would enhance a lot of things, um, you know, because life is the ultimate guide, model, and measure for for how to to live. So if we can take principles from that, um, we could enhance a lot of things. So do you think we can propose SDG 18, which is more towards biomimetic standards? Yeah, for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andreas. So great, Jamie. Uh, we will just. Uh, call this a day and it was really a pleasure to host you and it was insightful to listen to all the interesting work that you have done and your journey especially the fact that one question that i'm very curious about since you were trained by the master herself so what is that one thing which you know stayed with you out of all that you got inspired uh, from her the the first time i met her i was studying uh, engineering and international development and it was a pretty dark couple topics and one thing she said to me in Costa Rica was Jamie you have to recognize that uh, we're not a bad species we're just a very young one and that's always stuck with me and that oh. we're, just, we're just like young children on this planet that's been growing life for four billion years almost. You mean to say that other species are much older and they're more evolved from that perspective? Well, it's more of like how we look at ourselves. We're not the smart, you know, it, I guess it instills a bit of hubris and, and humility, sorry, humility in, in us That's and right. um, and recognizing we don't know everything. Uh, we haven't been here long enough uh, to know everything. That's really good. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. It was a pleasure having you with us. And thank you for the patient audience. It was really nice. Uh, okay. We, we will get in touch with the coordinates. We have some questions around that. So thank you, everyone. And thanks, Jamie, once again. It was really yeah, a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions and the conversation. It's, I, I love this, this debate and conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.